Welcome everyone to the Obligations of Memory podcast. I am honored to have Sammy Steigman here with me. He's a Holocaust survivor. Uh, he's from New York. So welcome, Sammy. Uh, welcome, Jeff. Welcome. I want to welcome uh, your audience. I'm a Holocaust survivor. I'm a child of Holocaust survivors. I'm uh, also a motivational speaker, and uh, I served in the Israeli Air Force from 1962 to 1965. Uh, let me start, first of all, uh, with my parents, also survivors. Uh, my father was an orphan of both of his parents. Uh, in those early days, with very few exceptions, only the men provided for the family, unable to take care of eight children, my grandmother decided to take the two youngest one and commit suicide. A stranger saved the children, but my grandmother did commit suicide. So my father grew up in an orphanage in Vienna, Austria. And at age 13, he was let go. So, uh, he became a streetwise, which is a different streetwise than today. That helped him during the war. It helped him after the war uh, to provide for the family, although uh, there was not enough food to provide for the general population. Uh, my mother, on the other hand, uh, was an uneducated woman. Uh, my grandfather had a store, did not allow her to go to school. She had to stay home, help provide for the family. Additionally, she was abused by uh, her stepmother. Uh, uh, I know that uh, especially uh, young people, you know, they go through stages like myself that you don't like one of your parents, they put restrictions, but they tell the young people, you may not like them at some point, but love them because there will be nobody in your entire life that will love you more than your parents. They are willing to give up their lives for you. And at the same time, whether you like it or not, you have the genes of both of your parents. So I took my confidence from my father. I took my sensitivity from my mother. Uh, in 19, 1941, when the uh, Wehrmacht attacked former Soviet Union, behind them were uh, the uh, uh, Einsatzgruppen, the killing groups that murdered the Jews and the subhumans, the Russians. And behind them were also the Romanians. And they annexed three areas that I'm familiar with, Bukovina, where I was born with my mother, at the same time, uh, Basarabia and Transnistria. So my parents and I were deported by the Romanians, not by the Germans. Uh, and I was there from 1941 to 1944 in a labor camp called Mogilev-Podolsk. Being only a year and a half, obviously I did not have the skill or the strength uh, to work. Uh, if you will ask any survivor, how come you're alive today? Everybody will use only one word, luck. There is no rhyme, no reason why somebody lived, somebody died. In my case, there are three reasons. Number one, I was never separated from my parents. Number two, I was subjected to medical experiments. Uh, I've been in pain all my life, every second of my life, even now looking at me, you will never know that I am in pain, uh, but uh, I'm suffering from head, neck, shoulders, and back. There, because it's not localized, they could not find a cure in my particular case, because it's constantly shifting from place to place. In the intensity, it can be extremely painful, eight or nine, uh, very mild, two and three. On the average, every second, it's three and four. Uh, the uh, other, uh, the third reason I'm still alive today, because not far away from the camp, there was a farm owned by Germans. And uh, the German woman brought food to the guards in the SS. So obviously she had access to the camp. And uh, after they finished with the medical experiments, a lot of people died through attrition. And there came a stage that I was dying of starvation. There are physical signs, big head, small stomach, small feet. And when she saw the physical signs that I'm dying of starvation, at the risk not only of her own life, but at the risk of her entire family, she decided to give me milk. 
I do not know the name of the person. I was not able to honor her, but in 2014, I was in Israel uh, to give testimony at Yad Vashem. And next to the museum, there is a garden honoring 27,000 non-Jewish people that saved Jews. And I was extremely happy to see a marker honoring the unknown righteous among the nations. And uh, I was very happy because indirectly, the woman that saved my life has been honored. Very nice. So tell me um, a little bit past the, past the camps. How, where, did you, uh, where did you get liberated from? Yeah. And then how did you um, go to, the, were you in a deportation camp? Tell me a little bit about that part of your life. Yes. Uh, in my particular case, I have no memories of the period of time when I was in the camp, which for me is a blessing in disguise. I don't have to relive those horror stories every single day, like the older generation. At the same time, until the Ahman trial in 1961 in Israel, the Holocaust survivors felt guilty, ashamed, and victims. And they wanted the children, okay, to have a normal childhood. So they did not want to burden the children with those horror stories. So uh, for uh, 63 years, I felt I don't belong to either generation. And two things have happened that changed my life forever. Uh, for 16 years in a row, the Holocaust Museum of Washington, D.C. closed its door to the general public for, for two days. Uh, I never went. But on November 1st and November 2nd of 2003, I decided to go. And uh, there were over 8,000 people from all over the world at the table of whatever city. I met a man born in the same city, been in the same camp, same years, he was taken when I was eight months old. I was taken when, it was, when I was a year and a half. That is the difference between history and living history. For the first time at age 63, I felt I belonged to both generations, okay? And uh, I, I decided to stop ignoring being a Holocaust survivor. And in 2007, I joined the Holocaust Museum here in New York the Museum of Jewish Heritage, a living memorial to the Holocaust. And in 2008, I got my first assignment to speak to sixth graders. Uh, if you remember, okay, all of the people that spoke publicly, if you remember your first presentation is not the best, not the most complete. I did not have a story. I did not know that I can tell a story and I had absolutely no idea what impact I will have on young people. Again, Bashir meant to be, they sent me thank you letters, each one better than the other. But one sixth grader changed my life forever. She wrote, P.S., your story was overwhelming. And I promise I'll pass your story to my children. Because of her, seeing the impact that I had on my first presentation to such young people, I decided to dedicate the rest of my life to reach as many uh, people as I can nationally and internationally. The other thing what I want to say is, uh, when the Soviets, the Red Army, liberated the camp, they re-annexed, okay, Bukovina, Basarabia, and uh, Transnistria, and they became part of Ukraine. But my father, unlike my mother and I, was born in Romania proper. So in 1946, the Romanian troop, uh, the Romanian government, allowed a small group of Jews, uh, to the best of my knowledge, approximately 3,000, to repatriate. My father being an anti-communist decided to choose the lesser of two evil. He decided to go back to Romania and we settled in a very small town in Transylvania. Uh, in 1949, uh, my father applied to go to Israel. Uh, it took how us 12 were, years. How old were you at that time? In 1959, you were how old? In 1949? Yeah. Yeah, I was born in December. Uh, 21, 1939. So in 1949, uh, I was almost uh, 49. Uh, I was almost 10 years old. Yeah. No, so six years old. Okay. So uh, basically, what happened? Uh, it took us, uh, let me see, uh, 12 years. In 1961, we finally got the visa. Uh, I served in the Israeli Air Force. And in 1968, I came to the United States by myself, without the language, without the money, from my father's side, from 42 people, only to survive. 
obviously my father and my uncle. My uncle was not a survivor. He was never in one of the three type of camps or later on 45 years later, another group of survivors was recognized uh, and they are called the hidden children. My father was a refugee in Shanghai. China was only one of three countries, only three that officially accepted Jewish refugees. And that was Dominican Republic, China, and the, and the Philippines. So, well, you, uh, so uh, Sammy, you were you haven't you haven't been married at that point, or are you? No, I got married only in. Uh, uh, let me see. Uh, 70, 73. Okay, I so got, tell me how you met your wife. Uh, <laughs> it's a funny story. Somebody came from Israel. <laughs> Nobody asked me that question. Uh, you know, uh, somebody, somebody came from, uh, from Israel and uh, her cousin uh, asked me if I want to meet somebody. And I said, why not? And when I found out that she's uh, just here to come and visit, doesn't live here, I said, forget it. And uh, later on, uh, okay, uh, her actual cousin uh, said, why don't you, I want you to meet my cousin. I said, why not? So I met her and guess who it was? The same person. <laughs> okay. So uh, eventually we got married. I used to live in uh, Wisconsin. That's where I got uh, uh, married, uh, had my son, got divorced in uh, 1983. I went back to Israel, never intended to come back uh, to the States. But my mother, uh, being a very sensitive woman, realized that I'm more American than Israeli. I live more here. She said, if you ever want to go back, I said, okay, you have my blessing. I said, mother, don't joke because one day I'll come and I'll say, I'm leaving tonight. She said, fine. That's what happened in 1988. Uh, I did not want to be to go to Wisconsin where I had my friends and everybody else because I did not want to disturb my son's life at this stage. Uh, so I came to New York at the height of the inflation. Okay, did not have enough money, had to take a job, and one thing led to the other, and New York is right now uh, my last home. So let me ask you, what was the career that you did when you came? I, I was an accountant, and I teach the young people to choose a profession that they are passionate about, because they will never work a single day in their life. Work will be pleasure, pleasure will be work. That happens with me. That's why if you will go on my website, Okay, you will be able to see that I answered questions last what's year. Website, what's your website name? S A M I. Uh, S A M I website. Wait a minute. <laughs> uh, I think it's uh, uh, let, let me see. Okay, I'll, I'll just tell you. Uh, okay, it's uh, S A M I. Oh, sammyspeaks.com. Sammyspeaks.com. Very good. Yeah. Sammy so tell, is tell, spelled, me about, tell me about Sammy yourself. is spelled S-A-M-I. That is my official first name. It's not short for anything. Okay. So okay. Tell, me, tell me about your son. How old is your son? Where is he living? Uh, my son was born in uh, 76. I have two grandchildren. I, as a motivational speaker, I tell two challenges that I had to overcome. Uh, I don't want anybody to feel sorry for me, but I want you to learn from me, okay, how I overcame it and under no circumstances should they ever give up, should they ever lose hope. Number one, uh, I was homeless in, uh, in 1996 at age 56. Uh, I overcame it by volunteering. Uh, when you volunteer, whether you know it or not, by helping other people, you help yourself. I used to volunteer for 18 different organizations because each one gave me something that was missing in my life. And uh, at the same time, I, like I told you, I have a son, I have two grandchildren, and he does not allow me to be in touch with my grandchildren. So I overcame that and be, uh, was able to move forward uh, because my need, and a need must be fulfilled, is to teach and to share. I cannot do it with my son. I cannot do it with my grandchildren. 
So when I uh, give my presentations, okay, those students, for the time that they are with me, through them, my need is fulfilled. And I tell them whether you know it or not, during the time for the hour, the two hours that we are together, you become my substitute grandchildren. Really and nice. that allows me, instead of being in the stuck in the, on the on past, okay, it allows me to move forward. And uh, so, how many lectures? Do I you am have? also, one second, I am also one of the one third of the Holocaust survivors in the United States living under the poverty line. My monthly income, the most expensive city in the country, is $1,393. And as you can see, I still smile. And the reason is because of my positive mental attitude. And uh, uh, I don't know if anybody, if all of you know Hebrew. If not, I will translate it. Sameach b'chelki. I am happy with my lot. So when I give presentations, although I'm a motivational speaker, I do not uh, charge. I don't want to feel that I'm doing it for a living, uh, but I have a foundation. Uh, on uh, June 9th, we give out a $5,000 scholarship. Uh, so all I'm asking is uh, okay for them, if they want to, to give a donation to my foundation. You will find my, my foundation and you will find it on the website. And you will also be able to download my PowerPoint. Terrific. So let me ask you, before we uh, finish our interview, you started to talk about what, how you want to educate, but I know it's what would you want to tell the audience who are going to be listening to this podcast? What would you want them to remember about you? Uh, the only thing that I want uh, them to remember that uh, Hopefully, uh, I am having, I'm playing a very small role in uh, educating the young people uh, because they are our future. Uh, hopefully, making a uh, small difference. Uh, but the most important thing, what I want, especially the young people, I want them, number one, to be proud of who they are. Uh, I want also for them to educate themselves on a subject that they are interested, whether it's the Holocaust, Israel, the conflict that that's happening in Israel, because if you are not educated in this subject, you cannot have a uh, uh, conversation with somebody that has a different opinion, you will not be able to change their uh, perspective. Uh, the other important thing is in my particular case, uh, instead of uh, highlighting my story as compelling as it may be, uh, it's a personal story. So I have started to do last year to talk about the evolution, the history of how the Holocaust genocide, okay, happened. Because I found out when I went to campuses that even college students that had family members that went through the Holocaust are totally clueless how the Holocaust uh, happened because it was stage by stage by stage slowly it took many many years and I by learning from history they will be able to sign the signs of today that can lead to other tragedies they will know how to combat it and hopefully prevent other tragedies uh, so uh, my mission life is uh, is there something that you is there something that you haven't accomplished yet? Pardon me? Is there something that you haven't accomplished yet that you would like to accomplish? Oh, yes. Uh, <laughs> uh, the one thing is that uh, apparently it's only by recommendation. Uh, okay. Uh, uh, one thing that uh, I would love would be uh, to become a hologram uh, the, with the Shoah Foundation. Uh, I know that somebody, one person recommended me, it's a young person, but uh, I guess more people have to do that. Uh, the other thing, uh, what I would like is to be a member of the Speakers Bureau of the Kufai, Christians United for Israel. Uh, they have a membership of 11 million people. Uh, normally they don't take 
people from the outside of their ranks. Uh, but uh, I had a, uh, a webinar with one of them that was uh, part of their speakers bureau, Irving Roth. So I have that on my uh, blog and the website. And uh, I know that if uh, in when I will uh, be part of their speakers bureau, they will be able to send me all over the world. Okay. Well, I, have a, I have a recommendation. I have a relationship with the Illinois Holocaust Museum who is doing the holographs as well. So I can put you in touch with the Illinois Holocaust Museum. Uh, I would, I would, that would be probably <laughs> the epitome. Okay. I mean, to become a hologram, then I would be <laughs> alive for at least 100 years. You'll be digitized. Uh, but I, don't, I, don't, I don't know what the process is. Okay, well, uh, I, can, I can help you with that. So I want to okay. thank you, Sammy, for giving us your time today. I really appreciate it. You are a great motivational speaker, as everyone who knows you knows. And um, I'm going to say uh, goodbye to you. I'm going to... Uh... Before I...